I want to introduce a man whom I consider to be a close friend, a spiritual confidant and confederate, a man who is filled with the Holy Spirit of the Lord and who has a message tonight that's going to change the way you look at the world. We've all been raised in school and in church with a certain paradigm, with a certain way of looking at life. Well, people like L.A. studying the Word and, by the way, exploring in the back country, as you will see, are about to change the way that you and I as Christians view the world. And with that, I'm going to introduce L.A. Marzulli. L.A. All right. Leon? Hello. Okay, it's 9.20. Let's all go home. It's too late. No. We want bedtime stories with L.A. Marzulli, don't we? You sure you guys really want to go down this path right now, right? <laughs> so we're the, we're the people that believe in the virgin birth, talking donkeys, floating axe heads, men that get squalled by whales and then regurgitated three days later, guys who walk on the water, guys who throw down staffs which become serpents. Right? That's what we all believe. Do we realize how completely crazy that is? Because it is. Go up, just go to your neighbor and go, yeah, my horse was talking to me the other day. See how far you get without one. Your 13-year-old comes up, I think I'm pregnant, I'm a virgin, but it was the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Floating axe heads, two gold coins that come out of fish's mouth. We're the people who sit in these buildings week after week and we listen to this stuff. And then when we go outside the buildings, there's like a huge disconnect switch. Well, the supernatural's not manifesting now. I don't have to worry about any of this stuff. You will see tonight, and it's, look, I only got like an hour, so how, how far can we really go? But we'll go as far as we can. And I've got like 100, 120 slides. Do the math, it won't work. <laughs> I already know it won't work. So I'm gonna go real quickly. This little character was found in Paracas. This is from the Chongos Necropolis. It's an elongated skull, similar to this guy, which is a female. It's not nearly as big as the one you're seeing on the screen. The Chongo skull was about like this. And the deal is, is a cranial deformation, which the Darwinist and the people, the archaeologists, insist that it is, or is it something more? And that's what we're going to explore tonight. This all comes from the groundbreaking book on the trail of a Nephilim, which is available at the first table on the left-hand side <laughs> as you come in the door. Shameless plug by L.A. Okay, Nephilim 101, real quick. When men began to increase the number on the earth, the daughters were born to them. Sons of God, sons of daughters of men were beautiful. They married many of them. They chose the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with man forever. He's mortal. His days will be 120 years. Nephilim on the earth in those days. And also afterward, and also afterward, when the sons of God went into the daughters of men and had children by them. And also afterwards means what? Thank you. We cleared that up real quick. And the angels who did not keep their position of authority but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, there's a linguistic tie here, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer punishment of eternal fire. Another incursion of the ten spies, um, and it is, I've actually looked at all the translations. Basically, it's this. Something is going on. Go down to the English Standard. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from a Nephilim. And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers. Excuse me. And so we seem to them. King James, last one. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so were we in their sight. Let's go back here. Go down to the last sentence. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God went into the daughters of men and had children by them. What's happening here is the unthinkable. Fallen angels are procreating with the women of earth and they're creating hybrid beings known as the Nephilim. And this was a worldwide disaster. It was an abomination in the eyes of God. So what does he do? And I write about this in the cosmic chess match. It's like move, counter, move, move, counter, move, move, counter, move between the fallen one and the most high God. They are unequally yoked. I get that. But the protocols of heaven, as Gary Stearman is always talking about, some we get, most of them we don't get. Most of them we don't understand what's really going on. All we know is that he allows this thing to go on for like 450 years before the deluge happens. Why doesn't he just snuff it out? 
I don't know. I have no answer to that. I only know that there's a vetting process, in my opinion. When God says to Noah, Noah, you, your wife, your sons, and your sons' wives. That's a vetting process. In a similar way, Jesus goes, you are my disciples, but one of you, right, is the devil. That's a vetting process. The most high, and he says it again, I think, in Genesis 6, 7, rather. He calls it out again with great specificity. Noah, you, your wife, your son, and your son's wives. So the idea of, of one of the wives being contaminated in some way, with all due respect, I can't go there. So God wipes out the whole planet, but he misses Ham's wife? Huh? Just doesn't work for me. Second incursion. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God went into the daughters of men and had children by them. And what do we see in, in Numbers 13, 33? The Nephilim are there. And the children of Israel will not go into the promised land. They are terrified. 40 years, they wander around. That generation goes in. Joshua and Caleb uh, go in to the promised land. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. This is the Chango skull. It's in the Ica ICA Museum. You will see the Chango's necropolis where I spent a very bizarre afternoon, and we'll get into that in just a little bit. Joshua, in the territory of Og, king of Bashan, the last of the Rephites, who reigned in Ashtaroth. Um, if you look at the, far, the guy on the far right, they're saying 11 foot 10 inches. I think that's a, a, a very conservative estimate. I would put Og of Bashan more like between 14, 15 feet. That, that's my guess, but we'll see. We'll keep going. So Og lived in this area, northern part, of, of Israel. Look on the lower right-hand corner, you'll see the little, uh, the blow-up of the map sort of thing. And that was the territory of Og. But this is really interesting. When Joshua and Caleb go into the promised land, and Nephilim are there. God holds the children of Israel, how long in, in, in Egypt before he lets them go? Why, he's, why they're there dwindling in Egypt, or dwelling in Egypt, I should say, right, and multiplying. Meanwhile, in the promised land, the second incursion is taking place. This is craziness. I don't get it. Why doesn't God just wipe them out? He doesn't. He doesn't wipe them out. Who were there? The Rephaim, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites. They're all there, the Canaanites. Everybody's in. All these different Nephilim tribes are in the promised land. What is the mandate from a holy, loving, generous, wonderful God whom we all love? Is Jesus a good? Is Jesus good? Yes. Is God good? Yes. Okay. So... College professors love to pull this on Christians, freshman Christians, when they come into the classroom. How many people are Christian? And some poor kid will raise his hand. Do you believe God is good? Oh, yes, professor, God is good. And God would never do anything evil or bad. Oh, no, God is capable of doing that. Well, then why does not he points right to the scripture and he goes, why does the mandate come down from Joshua and Caleb to go in and slaughter the inhabitants in the Holy Land, in, in Israel? Why does he allow that? Why does the mandate come out? And the poor kid sits there and goes, because he's never heard it and he's never been taught. And he's just massacred in front of his classmates. And all the, all the people are going, right, idiot. And the, and the college professor just goes like this. Got another one. It's evil. It's evil. And because my people perish from lack of knowledge, and this is why I do what I do, to arm the youth so they will not be deceived and so they'll have answers when goofy college professors want to act like God's evil. There's a reason why the mandate goes out. And it's because the Nephilim are there. And any time the Nephilim are there, any time the Nephilim are there. In Genesis, in Sodom and Gomorrah, which I believe was really the second incursion, and what we see happening um, in the Levant or the Promised Land, it's, there's no grace, there's no mercy, ever. It's wipe them all out. Kill men, women, and children. Burn the animals. Burn everything. So either we serve a loving, loving, wonderful, amazing God, or he's a capricious, genocidal, homicidal maniac. You can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. And the moment we factor in the Nephilim, can, can I have a slurp? Yeah. I drink it, he invented it. <laughs> the moment we factor in the Nephilim, everything changes. It be, when, I, I, when I got to the scripture 33 years ago, I, I, was, I was perplexed. I was vexed. I was tortured by the scripture. How? I don't understand this. And then I got Dr. I.D. Thomas's book and that explained everything. And then I read Pember and then I read and, and read and read and read and here we are. 
because it makes, once we factor the Nephilim in, everything, all of scripture, especially the end time stuff, everything just like a set of dominoes goes click, 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 and down we go. Let's move on. So all these tribes are existing. They all have different names. They all have different characteristics. In the book on Betrayal of the Nephilim, we list all the tribes and with some of their characteristics. One of the tribes is called the Long Necks. There is genetic, in my opinion, <coughs> and this is just conjecture, there is genetic manipulation going on by the fallen one to create man in his own image. That's the deal. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to create men in his own image. And he sort of succeeds, but not quite. They have six fingers, they got double rows of teeth, they're 20 feet tall, it's like, eh. <laughs> I hate when that happens. <laughs> so, are we having fun yet? <laughs> Bedtime stories with LA. <laughs> go to sleep, go to sleep. I can just see the women around one o'clock in the morning. Ah! <laughs> it's okay, honey, it's okay, it's okay. Okay, so here's the deal. Look at, look, at the, look at the graph. Joshua and Caleb are coming in with the mandate and the tribes are starting to get slaughtered and they know this. So the theory is <clears throat> the giants, the Nephilim tribes said, I'm not hanging around. Some of them went northward into Europe and then into the Americas, specifically in the Ohio Valley area and spread out from there. Others hopped on boats and went across the Mediterranean, across the Atlantic. You say, that's preposterous, so they didn't do that. Well, Thor Heyerdahl in Kantiki, and then later on in Ra, proved that it's very easy to build a little papyrus boat and surf the Atlantic and wind up in South America someplace. And the timeline of the Paracas people, right, coincides, coincidentally, with the conquest of the Promised Land. They show up there about 3,000 years ago, between 3,000 and 3,500 years ago. The Hopewell Indians, which is a total misnomer, Hopewell was a farmer, they don't even know what these people call themselves, but they call them the Hopewell or the Adena. They don't know their real names. They show up about 3,500 years ago in the Ohio Valley. Timeline's exactly the same. They begin to pr uh, produce what I would consider Nephilim architecture. The Great Ohio Circle, the mounds. You know what the archeologist said? It took 300 Native Americans with woven baskets and they moved the dirt in an assembly line. But then, let, let, let you read further down, it would take one dump truck 30,000 loads to produce one of the mounds. One dump truck, 30,000 loads. What's wrong with this picture? Is it just me or am I missing something? You know, and then who's digging the dirt? And then when they, when they, you know, when they get the, the baskets of dirt, and who's feeding the guys, right? I mean, the whole thing is just crazy. But because of a Darwinian paradigm, there is no God, there is no supernatural, there are no miracles, we all evolve from slime, and it doesn't really matter. And they hold on to this tenaciously. This is the religion of science, and it's the religion of academia. So Joshua and Caleb come in, this is the theory. Nephilim tribes, some of them get wiped out, many of them are running for their lives. They flee northward, some flee across the Atlantic Ocean. America's Stonehenge. This site is about... It was carbon dated 4,000 years. We don't really, know. it could be 4,000, could be 3,500, don't know. More testing needs to get done. This was um, given to me by Kelsey Stone, who's a college student, he's 23 years old. He's not a Christian as far as I know, so you can pray for him. And America's Stonehenge is in New Hampshire, and it's a henge, a henge is a circle, and, and it's a rock enclosure. And on the outside of the circle, there are standing stones, and these standing stones are put down into the ground. And the standing stones will mark the summer and winter solstice, the longest and shortest days of the year. They will also mark the uh, autumnal equinox and the vernal equinox, the fall equinox and the spring equinox, okay? So these standing stones, so Kelsey stone, and, and they're amazing, because when you stand in, this, in the center of the hinge on the longest day of the year, you know, the, the summer, the summer solstice, guess what? The sun comes right up over that, that standing stone. That's amazing. So why do people do this? Why do people get up on a Monday morning and go, oh, we're going to make a calendar, you know, it's, let's get some rocks. And it's crazy, right? I mean, why are people doing this? But they're doing this. And they know this stuff, and it's precise. It's mathematically precise, and something is going on here. I believe this is Nephilim architecture. Well, that's really interesting, LA. I want to see the proof of that. Glad you asked. <laughs> and it's coming right now. So Kelsey, Kelsey Stone, a 23-year-old, 22-year-old college student, goes on Google Earth. Oh, by the way, this is the, the nine foot by six foot slab of stone. 
which is used for what? Anyone, anybody want to take a guess what that slab was used for? And what kind of sacrifice was on the stone? Human sacrifice. Who demands blood? Bingo. So Kelsey Stone, and you got to look real closely. Look, you see the little triangle towards the center? Go down a little bit in the center, that little triangle white shape. You see the faint white line coming out? You guys see that? Look closely. Well, LA, we do not see it. I did not bring my contact lenses. I cannot see it. Maybe if a line was red, we could see it, LA, but you have failed miserably in this. Okay, the line goes from the center of the hinge out to the summer standing stone. Then he continues it. He's just a kid. He's just, I wonder where this thing goes. So he continues the line, <coughs> continues the line a little further, a little further, and he winds up where? In Stonehenge, England. And not only that, he intersects the center trilithon. I talked to a surveyor. I said, is there any way to do this in antiquity? He just laughed at me. He said, absolutely not. I go, what do you mean? He goes, there's no way you can draw a straight line like that. Well, was this coincidence? He goes, I don't know. Who is the prince of the power of the air? There's your triangulation. It gets better. So Kelsey goes, I wonder where it goes from here. And he continues and continues, and he winds up in Beirut, Lebanon. In Beirut, Lebanon is the home of the Phoenicians. And the Phoenicians are the descendants of the Canaanites. And the Canaanites are a Nephilim tribe. Now, Kelsey didn't know any of that because he doesn't work from a biblical paradigm, but we do. Is that proof that the Nephilim were there? It's pretty amazing, isn't it? I mean, we can do it in modernity. We can do it in the present age because we've got a whole satellite system in, up in the air, right? But go back 4,000 years ago. How do you draw a straight line thousands of miles from America, Stonehenge, New Hampshire and wind up over intersecting the center trilithon in Stonehenge, England? You can't do that. You cannot do it. You can't make string long enough and you can't calm the ocean. It's not going to work. <laughs> it's not. And the archaeologist going to go, well, we don't have the answer to that, turn the page. So I got thinking about this and I said, hey, Kelsey, extend the line. And I had another researcher extend the line. And this will be in volume two. And I'll tell you now because it's amazing. He extends the line and guess where he winds up? He winds up at the base of Mount Hermon. And guess what Mount Hermon is? Mount Hermon is the place where the 200 watcher angels ascended in the days of Jared. Hello, it's got the fallen one's fingerprints all over it. It's everywhere. And this is like right under our noses in New Hampshire. Unbelievable. It was a worldwide occupation. And what happened to these people? No one knows. Let's move on. There's, there's the line. There's the grid, part of the grid. It's extremely deliberate. It's about as deliberate as you can possibly get. So Peru, there's our little nightmarish friend. That's a femo, by the way, with only one parietal plate. This might be a good time to get into this real quickly. This skull here, it's a cast. It's a female between the ages of 18 and 25. The reason why I know that, I took it to two different dentists and showed them the bottom of the teeth. The dentists look at the teeth and they're, the, the wisdom teeth are just starting to come in. So they guesstimated that it's between 18 and 25 years old. So a normal human skull is comprised of four plates. The frontal plate here, two parietals on either side. There should be a suture. These things, I know you guys can't see this in the back. These things are suture lines and these sutures hold the plates together. So the, the, a normal skull, our skulls, hopefully. <laughs> Not sure about you, sir. See me after class. I'm just joking. Just joking. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Elliot was shot yesterday in the parking lot so after his lecture by an angry fan. Okay, so here's the sutures. Here's the suture. There's supposed to be a suture down here and there's not one. You're supposed to have two parietal plates. There's only one parietal plate. Here's the occipital plate in the rear. This skull is elongated, notice the ridge here, and it should have a parietal suture which separates the parietal plates. It does not. The skull you're looking at in this picture only had one parietal plate. It also had reddish auburn hair. Native Americans all throughout North, Central, and South America, all indigenous people have black hair. This hair was slightly auburn, auburn reddish. That's what it looked like. And in the sun, you could really see it. And we took a sample of that hair and I will show you what we did with it a little bit later on towards the end. So the, the skull on the right is a normal Inca, about 800 years old. 
The skull on the left, we believe, is a female, by the way, with only one parietal plate. Look at the difference. Now, there is a technique known as cradle headboarding. And this, this device you are looking at here came from the Chongos graveyard of the Chongos necropolis, which you'll see in a few minutes. And it's at least 1,000 years old, at least 1,000 years old. And they just picked it up right off the sand. And we'll be going down there at the end of January. We have 25 people, it's a tour. We've got six people signed up so far, so seating is limited. <laughs> see me after class, but okay. So you'll see what, what this do, does, does, it's like a textile, and I felt this thing. And by the way, whoever these people were, their textile is, is only in modernity, only in the modern age, do we create textiles like parachute silk that have more threads. These, these textiles are so fine, the closest thing we have to it is parachute silk. Who taught them that? Where did that come from? How does the culture just, you know, we're just going to make this, these finely woven, I mean, where does that come from? We read the book of Enoch, they traded the secrets of heaven. I believe all this has the fingerprints of the fallen one all over it. The cradle boarding, they're trying to make, they're trying to emulate this elongated shape. Why are they doing that? What's the point? Why are they trying to elongate the skull? Why would they do that? Why do you wake up on a Monday and go, well, our baby's now two weeks old. We need to make his head like a cone head. I mean, why would anybody in their right mind do that, right? Because you're emulating something, something which has power, something which is, which is, is superhuman, and you want your son or daughter to look superhuman. So that's the cradle headboarding. Many of the skulls that we saw were cradle headboarded. And you can tell the difference. The skull is misshapen. It has a very flat forehead like this. But you don't get this. You don't get this ridge on the top of the frontal plate. Or you don't get on some of the males this deep, almost like Cro-Magnum Neanderthal brow ridge. Heavy, heavy brow ridge. Oh, oh, just right above the eyes. Unbelievable. And you don't get you don't get a, a dismissal of one of the parietal plates. This is our, our archaeologist, Judd Burton. Um, city. <laughs> we walked into this place. We've been on the road from Lima, and this is, this is where we're going in January, once again with the tour. We walk into the little Paracas Museum, and there they were. And then Brian, our tour guy, goes, here! And he slides the door opens, and he starts handing out skulls. We all had rubber gloves on. And we're, I'm sitting there like a kid in a candy store going, you've got to be kidding me. Because here you can't look at anything. You, don't, you can't see doodly squat. And when you do see something, it's like they'll show an elongated spear like this, this big. And I got it in the book, right in the museum. This spear was a ceremonial spear used by the Hope Indians to signify the, the bearer's importance. Well, where did the spear come from? Well, we really don't know. Sure you do. You know that someone dug this thing up. Well, I have, I have, I have actual proof in the back, in the book, right, where these people would dig up these graves in, in the 1920s, 1930s, 1860s and forward, right, into the 20th century, and they would find 9, 10, 11, even up to 12 foot giant skeletons, six fingers, six toes, double rows of teeth, red hair, copper ornaments, and guess what next, was next to them? 27 and a half pound axe heads and long spearheads. So the point is, if the spearhead, right, is not ceremonial, and it came from a nine-footer, guess what? It's utilitarian, and they're lying to us. But this is, what, this is what we get in America. This is why we went to Peru, by the way. So and this is in Lima. The Darwinian paradigm is everywhere. This is in a museum in Lima. Sorry for the, the glare, it was behind um, glass. So here's, here's what they're proposing. Somehow, this chimp arises from who knows where, and he just decides to walk on two legs. And then over millions and millions and millions of years, somehow he becomes more human-like, right? And instead of like an ape-looking, stupid guy, somehow, magically, over a couple million years, go to the end, he becomes the modern-day human, running faster, jumping higher with his PF flyers. I mean, we're just, I mean, do you realize how crazy this is? And we all sit there and go, yeah, Darwinism, it's really good, let's spoon-feed it to our kids. It's taught everywhere, and it's a lie. It's completely, it's unfa it's a theory that's never been proven. And if Darwin had known about DNA with the oxyrobinucleic double helix spiral of life, he more than likely would have gone, whoa, and rescinded his theory. He didn't know about DNA. We know about DNA. Guess what? A hummingbird, when it lays its eggs, guess what you get? Penguins. No, you get hummingbirds over and over and over again. Do you get a hummingbird that's starting to produce an elephant's snout? No, you don't. You get a hummingbird. How about when an elephant gives birth? 
Do you get a striped elephant that wants to be a zebra? No, you don't. Now, we're screwing around with the, with the genome, so anything's possible at that point, right? Frogs that glow in the dark, because we're messing with the genome. But God created everything according to its kind in the seed in Genesis. Everything, I mean, we already know what, what's going on. Everything, is cre everything procreates according to its kind. Over and over and over and over. Just show me one example, Darwinist. Yeah, well, we don't see it now because it takes millions of years. Well, wait a minute. Surely one species on the planet, you know, would be in sync, right? We'd be seeing something changing into something else, right? You know, maybe a bird with a big elephant snout or something. Ah, I want to be an elephant, right? We'd see something. No, it's not there. Everything reproduces according to its kind. This is the lie, and there's a reason for it. Because what it does is it truncates and cuts Christianity off at the knees. There is no God. There is no supernatural. There is no God of the Bible. There are no miracles. There is no second coming. It's all mythos, and you're stupid for believing it. Oh, yeah? I could say something, but I won't. <laughs> no, you're not. We have the truth. Amen. And the truth has set us free. Amen. And the truth is that Jesus created everything by his, he spoke it into existence and everything was made was made by him and nothing that was made was, was not made without him, period. That's what the Bible says and I truly believe it. Why? Because when he walked the earth, what did he do? He's just, he's just having fun. Think I'll walk on water. You guys are hungry? Poof. Got leprosy? Poof. No problem. Blind in the eyes? Poof. Wherever he goes, goodness, 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 goodness. He destroys the work of the enemy. Guess what? When he comes back, I'm out of a job. Yes. I can go back and becoming a potato farmer again. All right. This is Senior Juan, the, the curator of the Paracas Museum. He is standing in the Chongos Necropolis, the Chongos Graveyard. It is the most desolate place I have ever been to. It gets less than a quarter of an inch of rain a year. It looks like the Sahara. It's, far, it's a seven mile, at least seven mile necropolis. No one really knows how big it is. It's all private property, which means we can go and look around because Senior Juan owns the owner. The government owns it. We'd never get there. So I'm walking around on the Chango Scrave, right? I'm looking down at all this. No one's told me anything about it. I'm walking around, I'm seeing all this like red stuff. What the heck is that? I reach down and it's pottery, thousands of years old pottery shards. What the Wakaros do, the grave robbers, they come in with iron bars like rebar and they go down into the sand and they keep poking until they hear something break and then they dig for textiles and gold and whatever. And the pottery is the leftover shards. It is everywhere, but it gets worse. It gets really macabre. As you're walking in the Chongos necropolis, at your feet are the remnants or human remains or other, other species, whatever they are. There are bones littered everywhere. There are mummy wrappings. There are ornaments. I mean, it's, it is the most bizarre place I have ever been to. The most bizarre place I've ever been to. And, the, and no one cares. You know, the Peruvian government, archaeologists, no one cares. So we're sitting there. I mean, I'm picking up this stuff going, you've got to be kidding me. Um, the Chongo skull, that real long one that you saw, came from this necropolis. The Chongos royalty, or the Paracas royalty, is buried about 25 feet deep. There was a shallow grave. You know that red-haired skull that I showed you? That was from a shallow grave, and I'll show you that in a second. You see right, this is Brian Forrester, our guide. You see right at his feet, there's a little area that's dug out. This is in Watcher 6, by the way. This is true. We, 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 we both, Brian and I, walked down into the thing, and I'm going like this with the sand, just kind of, you know, just not trying to dig. I'm just brushing the sand back, waiting for Richard, my my partner and friend to start filming. So I'm just brushing the sand and I keep brushing. All of a sudden there's a, a, a tibia bone that just appears. It's like, yeah, I mean, it, it's that crazy. Bedtime stories with LA. <laughs> yes, siri. This skull is the baby, the infant that accompanied the one with the red hair. Look at the textiles. This is thousands of years old. Look at the weave. Look at the textiles. Now, Senior Juan would not let us unravel this, but guess what? We got permission from Senior Juan when we go back down in, in, in early next year in January. We're going back down with, with a team of two archaeologists plus Joe uh, Taylor, who's the curator at the Mount Blanco Museum, who knows how to remove this without hurting the skull or hurting the textile. We have permission to remove it. What's so important about this? It's an elongated skull. If there's no parietal plate, or if there's only one parietal plate and no parietal suture, 
it's huge. If it's an infant with an elongated skull, it's huge because it means that something is going on um, that doesn't jibe with the Darwinian paradigm. Is it Nephilim? People go, I thought there were giants. Satan is trying to create man in his own image. The giants were one thing. He's, he's been messing with the genome. That's why there's all these different tribes all throughout the Levant. Let's move on. There's the Chongo skull. Notice the maxilla, the mandible, the lower jaw is the mandible. Look at the robust nature of the zygomatic arch, the bone from right that goes behind the eyes. And look at the skull. Another shot of a Chango skull. This is by Tara. It's at 7,000 feet, a three-hour drive from Paracas. The Catholic Church is built on this, okay? And when you're in the church, it's like, well, we're in a Catholic church. It's kind of boring, a bunch of saints, you know, dead, just a building. But when you go around the side of the church, this is what you see. Are you in Egypt or are you in Peru? Notice the bottom architecture. The stonework here is absolutely phenomenal. There is no two stones that are alike. There is no mortar used. And these stones go back five and six feet into the wall. They are polygonal in shape. Notice the trapezoidal shapes. They are not to hold, they are not to hold idols. There's a paper that we found on the internet talking about trapezoidal shapes and piezoelectric properties that links them together. These stones are andesite, very hard. You can't cut them with copper chisels, it won't work. You can't cut them. The stones were dressed from a quarry miles away. How did they move them there? And, and by the way, who did this? Look above the lentils and you'll see a completely different type of building structure. This is Inca, it's used with mortar, and it's sloppy. Can we all agree on that? I, call, I came to call it Inca slop, with all due respect to the Inca. How dare you call that? That's just racist, LA. Report you to the NASA real quickly here. And as a... <clears throat> So we were there, and I've never seen any, and, and oh, there's a close-up, but I don't have it here. One of the stones went like this, and then made this little 90-degree turn, and then from like three-quarters of an inch down to like about a half an inch. What? I've worked with wood. It's just like, you know, you can take pine, and you'd have a real hard time making that. Everything is precise. You cannot fit <coughs> a human hair between it. The archaeologist will tell you that this technique was lost to us. But the Inca built it, and we say balderdash. The Inca had nothing to do with this, with all due respect, sir. This is Nephilim architecture. It's the secrets of the fallen angels, in my opinion. You have to come to your own opinion, because you, can't, you can barely duplicate stuff like this in modernity. You'd be hard-pressed to duplicate what we see here in modernity. And then we went to the museum in Waitara. Look at the, look at the baby's skull to the left. The head is almost as large as the torso. Some doctors will say, oh, that's a product of hydrocephalia. No, it's not. Hydrocephalia, the head goes like a beach ball. This head goes straight up and it's uniform. <coughs> Genetic manipulation, anyone? This is in Cusco. And these, this is the remnant, it's all that's left of what was an amazing um, site. It still is an amazing site. Look at the stones on the bottom. That woman was about five feet tall. Notice the polygonal shapes. Notice the way they fit. And these shapes, when you see a shape like this, why would you do this? Because you can, and it's fun. See, see the angle here? This is an exposed rock. Something happened to this site. Above it is the Inca slop, where they're trying to take the stones and refit them, but they don't know how, and they can't. So they mortar. What's interesting about this picture See the, way that, see the way that cut goes all the way through the rock? It's highly polished. So when you go back and you look at all these cuts of all these rocks, that surface goes all the way back, five, six, seven, eight feet, which means that the, it's not just dressed in front. The other rock has to sit perfectly on it. And guess what, folks? They do. No saws, no cranes. The quarry here is 40 to 60 miles away. These are the smaller stones. So how did they do it? How did they do it? You know what, I, I went to one anthropologist, you know what he told me? Well, it's just like Einstein, LA. You know, we have an Einstein and then, you know, he just kind of sprouts up and he, and he has all this knowledge and then he dies and the culture dies off and everybody forgets it. Okay. That's what you want to believe. Let me know how that works out for you. 
But there's another paradigm here, and it's out of the fallen angels. And of course, the fallen angels mean the supernatural. And if the supernatural is alive, oh my gosh, does that mean the Bible's alive? They can't go there, because the moment they go there, they, they lose it. They lose the Darwinian paradigm. They must guard the Darwinian paradigm at all costs. So guys like me and other people that, that get into this stuff, they don't want anything to do with us. They're afraid of us. And now we're exposing it. Are you aware that this is why in Lima, the two gold mummies, which were over nine feet tall, were taken down, but the display is no longer there. You can't see it anymore. What happened to the mummies? Oh, we have to take them down for repair work. Uh, when are you going to uh, show them again? Well, that's well, probably never. And that's the end of that. <laughs> you, go to, you go to the National Museum in Lima, right? There used to be a whole room about a third of the size of this room. Well, not that big, but a bit, very large room with all these elongated skulls, not there anymore. And what you see is that the window is closing which is why we got to get back down there. But in the private collections, the stuff is still there. Let's move on. Here's a great example of normal stonework. And then the Inca go, well, we've got some leftover stones. What do we do with them? I don't know. I think it fits here. No, it doesn't fit here. All right, we'll just put some other rocks around it with mortar. <laughs> and then the Spaniards come in and they do their sloppy work. But nothing looks like this. And every stone is different. And they're all interlocking. And this is in Cusco. And this is the dream I had. See the lentil on top, that piece? The dream I had before we went to the site the night before, I truly believe it was a Holy Spirit dream. That lentil is what I kept seeing over and over. This cross piece with all these holes. I'm going, what the heck is that? And I awakened and I told Richard, I kept having this weird dream. The dream kept changing, but superimposed over the dream was this like bar of stone with a bunch of holes in it. I turned the corner and I see this about, I just about keeled over, literally. I went, oh my gosh. Look at the grooves and the slots in this thing. This is not a shrine. An idol did not sit in this. This was, at some point, in the far distant past, in our opinion, some sort of highly complex machine. It did something. Perhaps it tuned the building. We don't know. We think it was part of a grid system of communication. All this stone has piezoelectric properties, which means for those of you in the audience who have built crystal radios, that's what they do. That's what this stuff will do. It conducts electricity. And you go there and the, and the Torah guy goes, well, this is where the really important idol sat. We all just look at each other and just broke out laughing. You know, that's just nonsense. Can't you see there's like holes and, and grooves. Something was sliding. It's a machine. It's a machine. And when you go through this thing, you realize that, you know, this wasn't, they didn't put grass thatch over this thing. And it's thousands and thousands and thousands of years old. There's no mortar, interlocking blocks. Not, one, not two blocks are the same. They're all different. And it was built by a race that we have no idea where they came from. I call this Nephilim architecture. There's a shot, inner shot of the slides, the holes. It's like something moved in and out. We have no idea. It's all been destroyed. We can only, we can only guess. This is Saksebaman at 12,000 feet above sea level. The boulders here range between 40 and, six, and 120 tons, or perhaps even heavier. Well, that's Ron Moorhead with the gold shirt on in front of the, one of the larger stones, 120 tons, quarried from 40, 60 miles away, and moved 2,000 feet up to the 12,000 foot uh, level because they were quarried down around 10,000 feet, moved up 120 ton stones with, by a culture like the Inca that with with, didn't have a wheel. So how the heck is that possible? But they insist that that's what, but the Spaniards, when you go back and read the ancient accounts, and the Spaniards sit there and go, when, uh, who built this? And the Inca goes, we didn't build it, it was here when we got here. And guess what? What does that prove? Once again, it fits the paradigm of Nephilim tribes spreading out, fleeing, fleeing from Israel, right? Coming over here and doing what? Setting up Nephilim architecture. Why? To be worshipped. And that's what we think happened over and over. Here's a shot of the wall. Do you realize how nuts this is? And guess what? There's not a glyph, not a carving, not a signature, nothing. The actual wall itself is the signature. And whoever did this, again, you, would be, you can do it in the modern age, but you would be really hard pressed to do it. And this stone is all andesite. It's very, very hard. And copper chisels don't make a dent. It's like cutting a tree with a plastic knife. Let's move on. Never shot. And these are mortarless construction. And you cannot, thousands of years later, you cannot put a human hair between them. That, that's, oops, don't do that. Don't lose the microphone. Whew. Never shot. Sak Sebaman. This is Oye Tintambo. Again, 
It's not a temple. It's some sort of uh, device. And by the way, all these sites, when you go from Giza and you draw a line, Cusco, Sacsayhuaman, Oye Tintambo, right out to Easter Island. You think, that's, you think that's just a coincidence? Heck no. There was a grid, an ancient grid, which covered this planet. And it enslaved the human race. It was used to enslave the human race. That's one of the reasons for the flood. To wipe out the Nephilim and wipe out the ancient grid system. And the remnants of the ancient grid system were all around us. It was a grid system. I don't know how it worked, but it used piezoelectric stones, which conduct electricity. And, and however this, whatever this thing was, and however it worked, it, it communicated. And I believe it, it, maybe it was transportation, maybe it was communication, but I also believe it enslaved the human race. That's conjecture. Let's move on. The, the stones below are the Inca work. The stones above are the original. Something cataclysmic happened to the site. The stones have been thrown down as if a violent wave. This is way up. This is a couple, about a thousand feet above the, uh, the valley floor. Maybe not that much, but close to it, above the valley floor. And you see that something came in and wiped this structure out and, and the stones are broken. And some of them lay here, some of them tumbled down to the valley below. These stones were quarried across the valley at a quarry, and I'll show you a picture of that in a little bit. Um, and we've got some skulls and stuff that which we've seen from that. Here's one of the, one of the uh, joints. Why would you do that? Why would anybody in their right mind want to make a joint like that? Talk to a stonemason and tell him, hey, I want to make this, I just want you to make this joint for me. <laughs> and do this. Take some nice soft marble, like marble bricks. Just take three marble bricks and say, hey, I want you to make this joint. How much is it going to cost? With marble. And see the price tag you get. This is andesite. And these stones weigh between 10, 20, up to 120 tons each. This is the inside of one of those little niches. And we, we had a, a line on, um, this is in Oye Tintambo again, where we were, um, had a line from a, a native, a kid who had grown up there, who was in his 20s, who said there used to be a cave that he used to go into as a child. And so we said, where's the cave? And we had a choice to go to Machu Picchu, Machu Picchu, or go cave, cave hunting. Guess what we did? <laughs> <laughs> See ya, Machu. And we wound up crawling around the jungles of Peru, which was absolutely bonkers. And I'm, you can't see it, but I'm sick here. I'm, I've got, I'm not doing real well, but I'm running a fever and the whole deal. But we, we pressed on and we found the cave and we crawled in the cave and we found elongated skulls. And you can see this, this skull here has two frontal plates, and it shouldn't. It should only have one frontal plate. It has two frontal plates. So the skull's anomalous. And we were just blown away because we actually found skulls ourselves. This is a new picture. This was sent to me from, this is Brian. Look at the skull on the bottom. <clears throat> this comes from the, the quarry directly across from Oye Tintambo. <clears throat> this came last night, actually this morning. Yeah, I am really envious. <laughs> You have no idea. Dun, 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 dun. We are going back. And see, there in Peru, you can, you, can, you can see this stuff. You can go and you can investigate. We can take DNA samples. Up here, you can't do any of this stuff. Here's a perfect example of another skull from uh, Paracas. Notice only one parietal plate. You're looking down on the skull. There should be a parietal suture. There's none. This is another shot of the skull I have up here. And it'll be back on the back table so you guys can come up and examine the cast. Jesus warns us in Matthew 24, as in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. I now realize that this, this scripture is so pregnant with meaning and I've only touched the surface of it until fairly recently where we realized that, oh my gosh, the days of Noah were really unlike any other time in all of history. One of them obviously is the Nephilim. We know that, but it gets, it gets much bigger and, and much more complex. There was a, a grid system there was a grid system that, it, that covered the planet, and this flood wiped out this grid system. Are we in the days that are likened to Noah? Basically, I would say yes. Here's the theory. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. The bottom line here, I move really quickly because I spent too much time on the earlier parts, and we've got to get going. They, when you go back to Genesis 6, is nothing to do with human beings. They is the fallen angels, the sons of God. That's who he's talking about. They were eating and drinking. Who is the they? 
It's not man. Go back and read Genesis 6. It's all talking about the sons of God. And the sons of God are the Bnei HaElohim, which are the fallen angels. And that's what they're doing. They were eating and drinking. The coming of a lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. It's amazing how we believe in all the things I listed earlier, the virgin birth, the floating axes, the talking donkeys, and all this other stuff. And we, and we look at this and go, ah, he's not going to really do anything. We're protected by the blood. Yeah, we are. I get all that. We're victorious. I get all that. We come back with him at the battle of Armageddon. We watch him destroy the works of the enemy with the breath of his mouth as he just speaks and boom, the sword comes out. And it's literal. It's like a sword and it wipes them all out. It's literal. We come back with them. We get the victory. I get all that. But we also know there's coming a time and I believe we're seeing it now. It's all around us. I'll talk about this tomorrow. It's burgeoning. It's real. It's not going away. The enemy is ramping up. The lawless one is beginning, is, is the mystery of iniquity, which we're working with thousands of years, is beginning to manifest in ways that I've never seen before. You know, and the church jithers, and the church is asleep, and the church won't address it, and pastors don't talk about this stuff. Are you aware, and I'll talk about this tomorrow in my talk, in April 2013, this year, 1,000 UFOs sighted worldwide. 1,000. What do you think that is? All swamp gas reflecting off weather balloons? The planet Venus caught in a the thermal pocket of air? being told by a flock of geese. That's what we're looking at, right? Baloney. Baloney. Let's move on. I believe the fallen has been trying to manipulate the genome in order to create man in his own image. 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 Two frontal plates there, folks. Chongos. Look at the back of the Chongos skull. And here we have the red hair. Look at that one. See the brows over the eyes? This one weighed more than any other skull that we weighed. Significantly more than any other skull we weighed. No, no parietal plate, only, or one parietal plate, no, no parietal suture. That's looking down on the forehead. They look something like this. Now, the artist makes them look benevolent. Hi, we're just friendly coneheads. <laughs> just come over for a barbecue. We might be grilling your arm, but don't worry. Okay, watch this clip. It happened here in the Americas. This is Robert Mirabal. I interviewed him. His interview is in, in the uh, Amatrail of Nephilim. He's a Native American, full-blooded, past Pueblo. And I saw this video, and I was blown away by it. I said, Robert, where did you get this from? Where did you get this story from? Well, my grandfather told me. Where did he get it from? Well, his father or his grandfather and back and back and back and back and back. And the oral tradition is there. And the archaeologists just recently are starting to look at the oral tradition of these people and go, wait a minute, maybe there's something here. Because we all have oral traditions. The Bible at first was oral tradition until it was written down. So these people hold very very dear, the oral traditions, and they pass these stories on one to another, down grandfather to grandson or father to son, and it goes down. And Robert Rearball is a musician, and so he's also an artist. And so what he did is he created this pageant, and it's an outdoor stage with lighting and musicians. And you'll hear, listen real closely, make sure the volume's up on this, because he speaks very softly. And, the, and you'll hear him say, a long time ago, the gods and the, the sky gods, I think he says, the gods in the sky are the sky gods, saw the men, men and men and women of earth, and they came and had children by them. Just listen to what he says. It is mirroring the Genesis 6 account. And this is what flipped me out. And I said, Robert, where did you get this? My grandfather. Do you know this mimics, you know, mimics Genesis 6? I was like, ah! <laughs> I mean, it's just unbelievable. It's, this story could be thousands of years old. Watch it. And this is past Pueblo. It's right in America. Right here. Right under our noses. Watch this. Robert Mirabal. Robert Mirabal. And a long time ago, they say there were giants that roamed the land. They came from the sky, fell in love with the sons and daughters of the earth. They had the ability to reach your mind and foresee the future. The men would go hunting in the mountains for deer or elk, while the woman would prepare 
offerings to honor these giants. Okay, so you kind, of, you kind of get the point here. Where does that come from? When I was down in Navajo country and <clears throat> I got to see some petroglyphs, I also interviewed a Navajo elderess who told me the story about the giants and how the tribe killed the giants. Uh, Doc Marquis was down at the same place. He saw better petroglyphs than I saw. I saw, I saw a lot of them, six fingers, and I saw giants in, in the petroglyphs. It's here. It's like right under our noses. May, uh, Washington Herald, May 31st, 1919. <clears throat> Seymour, Texas, May 30th. Oil drillers claim to have found bones of a prehistoric giant 10 feet high. Vancouver Sun, August, 19, August 18th, 1922. Mexico City. The Department of Agriculture yesterday received from an agent on Tiburon Island, Gulf of California, the skull of a primitive man more than 10 feet tall. <clears throat> Excuse me, it was found a few days ago. Other bones of similar size have been encountered. Spokane Daily Chronicle, February 2nd, 1909. The skeleton of a prehistoric man of large size has been found in a town 10 miles southeast of Mexico City, according to a news receipt here yesterday. Watch this politically correct sentence. The discovery was made by a peon who unearthed a skeleton which measured about 15 feet in height. Isn't it great? You, you go back in the 19th, you know, early century, by a peon. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your cultural sensitivity. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Okay. Anyway, 15 feet in height. <clears throat> So, we'll continue. Daily Public Ledger. A dispatch from Casapos, uh, Michigan. Is that Michigan or Missouri? <coughs> Excuse me, Michigan. Just testing you. I knew. I just was making sure you knew. <laughs> Says that an opening amount near Diamond Lake went to get giant, a prehistoric race was unearthed. The bones of the skeleton are well preserved. The lower jaw is immense. An ordinary jawbone fits inside with ease. By measurement, the distance from the top of the skull to the upper end of the thigh bone it's five feet, five inches. A doctor, a doctor, a doctor who is present stated that the man must have been at least 11 feet tall. Okay? September 27th, 1924. That's less than 100 years. <clears throat> Has the human anatomy changed in the last 100 years? Has a medical doctor trained in 1924 would know the skeletal structure of a human being? Yes or no? Yes. Now, there's obviously been advances in medicine. That's what we're talking about. The basic skeletal structure of a man in 1924 is exactly the same as we have today. Maybe we're a little taller, right? But is the skeletal structure the same? <clears throat> would a doctor know how to measure a disarticulated skeleton and an articulated skeleton? Of course he would. That's what he's been trained in. A doctor, a medical, an MD knows every bone in the body by name. They have to. That's what they do. Let's move on. <clears throat> <clears throat> Hopkinsville, Kentucky. The bones of a giant 10 feet in height were found near Lewisport. My conversation with a tenured professor about the bones. This is an archaeologist, a tenured professor at a major university. So I said, I said, well, what about the doctor who measured the bones and estimated the size to be 11 feet tall? You know what, you know what this person told me? And I kid you not, because they are entrenched in the Darwinian paradigm. This is what I was told. The doctor did not know how to measure. <laughs> now, if that's not intellectual fascism, I don't know what is. Seriously. Do you, do you think I just fell off the turnip truck yesterday, buddy? Let's move on. <laughs> We're wrapping it up here. Okay. So here's the red-haired skull from Peru. It's a female. 
It's an auburn reddish hair, all right? So we took a hair sample and we brought it back. There's also a phenomenon, I'll talk about this at, at length tomorrow, known as the so-called alien abduction phenomena. People are taken against their will. If you're a female, gynecological, ovum is taken, male, sperm is taken, other things happen, we won't go into here. Very, very disconcerting. Sometimes there's an implant put in you. I don't have my laser pointer. Is this a laser pointer? Never give LA a laser pointer. Hold on. I might get feedback, but maybe I won't. Look right there. See it? Look right there. See it? See that little tiny speck? Right above the number 65? See it? That's an implant. We know the man. He's been abducted since he was five years old. He's a frequent flyer. He's had the implant. Yeah, it, it's funny, but that's what they call themselves, frequent flyers. And most of these people that I talk to have advanced cases of what, what would be called Stockhausen syndrome. They now side with their captors, and they don't think there's a way out. But this man has an implant. This is a very recent um, x-ray. We're actually working with this guy, and we're going to extract the implant. Hopefully, some of this will be in Watcher 7, but we'll see. So the reason why I'm showing you this is because we've got the red hair, and we've got a hair from a man who was abducted and had sex with a female hybrid who had long, blonde, whitish hair. And when he awakened, I'm not making this stuff up, I wish I was. When he awakened, he had the presence of mind to take one of the hairs off his body, was still there. Okay? So now we have four hair samples. This is astounding. And you're the first audience to hear this. The human hair, the dyed human hair, we took another human hair that was dyed, a female hair that was dyed. We have the reddish auburn hair from Paracas and the hybrid hair. We put them in a machine known as Raman spectroscopy, which measures and, and, and plots on a graph the molecular structure. Look at the control sample, the blue, <clears throat> the lightish blue. See it? It comes in on the left-hand side. I'm going to get my pointer. It comes in on the left-hand side here and goes in a little horse showing out. See that? That's a human hair. Look at the dyed human, dyed human hair. It's green. It starts off below the human hair and then just goes straight up and off the charts. Now look at the hybrid hair, which is sort of auburn, right? Got it? See it? And then look at the mummy hair. The hybrid hair is sort of a, um, a reddish hair and the mummy hair is a dark blue. And go down to the left-hand corner, go down here. This was better. See this? Look at the slopes. See the way they track? See, look at right here. Every little jot and tittle, almost exactly the same. So what does that prove? For someone that knows how Raman spectroscopy works, there is a relationship between these two hairs. One is at least 2,000 years old. The other one is from modernity. It, they bear no resemblance to the human hair at all, do they? <clears throat> None. And yet the slopes track, don't they? The slopes just track. Not perfectly, but anyone who knows about Raman spectroscopy, and I've shown it to two or three people that know this stuff, look at it and goes, wow, what's going on? This fits the theory. It doesn't completely solidify it. I can't say these were Nephilim. I can't say that. And I don't know where this hair came from, from the alleged hybrid being. But what we do know is that the hair that's at least 2,000 years old and the blondish hair from modernity, modern age, they're tracking. There's a relationship between them. And in my opinion, it's the same guy, the same fallen one, just as in the days of Noah, so it will be when the Son of Man returns. What happened then is happening now. And we're starting to get hardcore, physical, scientific evidence, which you can't blow out of the water. It's not conclusive yet. You can't go out there and go, yeah, I only prove that people that are abducted are actually, you know, nothing. You can't say that yet. We don't know. But there's definitely a strong correlation. And right now it's fitting our hypothesis. <clears throat> There was a grid system. When I was in Cusco with my partner, Richard Shaw, 
We had finished a late night dinner. We were exhausted, 12,000 feet. It was towards the end of our trip. We had seen all this stuff, and now we're going to fly home the next day. And we're, we're talking, and we're wondering, what are we looking at? We're, we're, this has never happened to me before. We had a cosmic download. And look, I'm not saying this, you know, people go, I had a vision. But the Holy Spirit does do stuff like this, and I believe he does it today. And I've never had this with another human being. We had a cosmic download. The Lord gave him the same thing as he's giving me at the same time. We're looking at each other. Are you getting what I'm getting? He's going like this. I'm going, I'm holding my head going, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I'm leaning up against the wall saying this over and over and over again. And we were freaked out because we went, we can't tell anybody this. This could get us killed. And it could. But now that the book's out and the DVD's out and we've been on coast to coast and all over and prophecy of the news, we don't care anymore. Because it's out, right? And what we realized is there was an ancient grid system. This is the download we got. Think about this. As in the days of Noah, so it will be when the Son of Man returns. This is how deep it goes. Not only were the Nephilim here, but there was an ancient grid system. And this looks, these were all the ley lines and all the hot spots were. There was an ancient grid system. This is from Giza, which spread out over the earth, okay? The grid system is back and we help build it. And the grid system is the system of satellites we have over the planet. Right now, it's benevolent. But we all know that at some point in time, you will not be able to buy, sell, or trade without that mark. The technology is here literally to enslave the human race, just like we were enslaved in the days of Noah. There's no difference except the technology is completely different than it was in the days of Noah. Right now it's benevolent, but the Antichrist will use it at some point in the near future to enslave every man, woman, and child on this planet. And I'm not making that up, that's scriptural. You will not be able to buy, sell, or trade without the mark. The good news is, the good news is, he knows all this, and he's written it all down in advance for us, and when he comes back, we will have the victory. We will have the victory. We will have the victory. When, the, when he comes back, when the rider on the white horse comes back, and this is why he has to come back soon, because it can't go on too much longer with the chimeras that are being messed with. Just look at what's going on on the planet. The planet is seething and the church dithers. The planet is coming apart at the seams and the church is asleep. Chimeras are being, being manipulated in underground labs. And in labs, like, like a couple of years ago, the British press, we killed 150 chimeras. Oh, that's great. How many didn't you kill? Right? It's happening. The days of Noah are happening right before our eyes. And the church sleeps and the church dithers and we don't talk about this stuff. And yet we're the people that talk about the virgin birth and floating axes and talking donkeys and guys that get swallowed by whales and staff that turn into serpents and guys that walk on water. But we won't look at the signs and wonders right in front of our noses. It is unbelievable. We need to wake up. You're awake. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. But the vast majority of your brothers and sisters are not. Quit worrying about when we get taken home. That's his business, not my business. Get in the battle. Stop the habitual sin in our lives, whatever that is. Stop the habitual sin. Go before him and repent and say, take me, use my life. Pour me out, Lord, but you can't be sinning. You can't have habitual sin in your life and move to the front lines. You won't do it. It's suicide. The enemy will cut you down in, in two seconds. You can't have that. I'm not saying sinless because we all blow it. But you can't, if you're a guy, you can't be walking around looking at pornography on Monday morning after going to church on Sunday. If you're a woman and you're holding bitterness in your heart, you know what I mean? And those are just two sins which are really blatant. Get rid of the habitual sin. Decide that we're going to start talking to people at the gas pump. Hey, did you hear about that weird earthquake, that 9.0 in uh, Fukushima? Are you aware of the ancient manuscripts talk about this stuff? Don't say the Bible. You say the Bible, it's like, click, gla eyes glaze over. Whoa. <laughs> Not another Jesus freak, man. <laughs> oh, for real. I was at Woodstock and I inhaled. How about that? <gasps> and so did probably a lot of you out there, too. <laughs> okay. But I don't anymore. Because that's a catapult into the second heaven. And the fallen one lives there. And I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Why do I need that nonsense? Get involved. Get involved. 
decide that we're going to make a difference, that we're going to destroy the works of the fallen one. That's what we're called to do, not argue about when we go home. I mean, it's great. I want to go home. I really do. I can't wait. I can't wait to see him face to face. This planet stinks. It's a stinko planet. It really is. Look at the nonsense that's going on. It's crazy. And guess what? It's getting crazier. But we got kids out here and we got to think about them. And you've got loved ones that don't know him, that aren't filled with his spirit, right? That are stuck in bitterness, right? That walk around weighed down. Where's the joy? Get involved, folks. Get involved. You know, there's all sorts of resources by all these, all these incredible authors out here. You know, it supports our ministry, but buy two and start handing them out. Buy two or three and start handing them out. Wake up your people. Wake up your pastor in a nice way. That's what we're called to do. Destroy the works of the devil. The time is short. I don't know how much more time we have, but the noose is closing. And it's closing all around us. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Father, that your word and your prophetic utterances tell us what's going to happen ahead of time. And we know that. And we walk in the surety, Father, that we have the victory in Jesus, that he will come back in the clouds and his feet will touch the Mount of Olives and that baby will split in two. Hallelujah, Lord, bring it on. We rejoice in you. We long to see you, Father. Tonight, I would pray that these words that we talked about this evening would be sealed in our hearts and minds. But Father, there would be no fear. There would be no fear. We would not go out of here afraid. We'd go out of here with boldness, really ticked off that this is the plan of the fallen one. And he seeks to enslave humankind again. We would be bold. Father, put, light a fire in us, Lord, a holy fire. Get us involved. Get us motivated, Father. We thank you, Father, that you are faithful and that you will strengthen us and that you will protect us from the evil one. We love you, Lord. We long to see your coming. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. Thanks, you guys. You've been great. Happy dreams. <laughs>